Welcome to the healthiest half hour or so anywhere on the internet today. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hope you had a relaxing Memorial Day weekend, and we appreciate you getting your official week started on a healthy foot with us here today. And on tap today, lots of big things, including the British Navy giving two thumbs up to the health of its sailors, vegan food now being served on the high seas. And a legendary boxer is training for a comeback more than a decade after knocking meat and dairy out of his diet. We're going to tell you all about that. Plus today, we're going to be TKOing a myth about vitamin K. We've got K1, K2, and E you. So what does the body do with vitamin K and what foods have it? We're going to find out when Dr. Vanita Rahman joins the show. Dr. Rahman, definitely looking forward to getting the lowdown on K with you. Thank you, Chuck. I'm looking forward to it too. And COVID-19 is attacking people of color at an alarming rate. So what is driving the racial disparities of the virus? Registered nurse and certified health and wellness coach Deetra Dennis is here with a look at the inequities of the global pandemic. Deetra, thanks for joining us today. Looking forward to hearing from you. Glad to be here. And we're also going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag and answering your questions. So if something is on your mind, go ahead and post it right now in the comments. Dr. Raman, she will be here to answer as many as she possibly can on the show before time runs out today. But let's get things started with a check on the headlines and five things that you need to know for Tuesday, May 26th, 2020. We start with a look at the coronavirus by the numbers. A 100,000 thousandth person is expected to die of COVID-19 in the U.S. within the next 24 hours. As of Tuesday morning, the death toll stands at more than 98,000 as states continue to reopen, with the total number of cases nationwide since the onset of the pandemic climbing north of 1.6 million. The U.S. now accounts for 28 percent of all coronavirus-related deaths worldwide, according to data published by Johns Hopkins. And new data out of the United Kingdom is showing the racial divide of COVID-19 extends well outside the U.S. borders. Researchers at Oxford scoured through more than 3,800 coronavirus tests, finding that black people test positive at nearly four times the rate as whites. Similar differences are being reported for people living in deprived areas compared to those from more affluent regions. We're going to have more on this later in the show. A new study is showing the potential risk facing pregnant women who test positive for COVID-19. A study of 16 women showed damage to their placentas after they gave birth. Researchers at Northwestern say the tissue showed signs of abnormal blood flow between the expectant mothers and babies in the womb. The children were carried to term and appeared healthy at birth despite the compromised organs. The study was published in the American Journal of Clinical Pathology. Sailors in the British Navy can now keep it plant-based while sailing the high seas. A pair of aircraft carriers are now serving vegan meals, including, get this, lentil lasagna, falafel, and veggie burgers, along with select desserts. The Ministry of Defense tells the Mirror newspaper in the UK that Quote, healthy living in the armed forces is of vital importance, and we encourage a nutritious diet. Kudos to you. And call it a plant-based punch-out. Boxing legend Iron Mike Tyson is training for a comeback of sorts and relying on a plant-based diet to help KO Father Time. The 53-year-old is hoping to get back into the ring for a few charity bouts. Tyson uppercut out meat from his diet and jabbed dairy out as well in 2009. His last professional fight came back in 2005. Good luck, Iron Mike. Time now to continue a discussion that began on the show last week. A viewer by the name of Rose wrote in to ask what the differences were between vitamins K and K1 and K2. There are a couple different kinds. And are they both found in leafy green vegetables? All good questions. So what are the best sources? Why do we need vitamin K in the first place? Here now with the answers that are in fact A, O, Okay. Eh, couldn't help myself. Dr. Vanita Rahman. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Rahman. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. Um, really, really grateful for our listener for bringing this up last week. Thank you. Um, and I said that I would look into this and get back to you. So as promised, um, let's talk about vitamin K today. And I put yeah. together 
Uh-huh. You are a woman of your word. I know you were excited. You you got in touch with me on Friday. Said, "Hey, can't let can't let Rose down here. So let's talk about this." Absolutely. So we, I, you spent the weekend putting together a presentation. God bless you. It was a holiday weekend. A lot of people were out relaxing, but you you were doing a lot of good research. So let's bring that forward. We've got two forms. We've got K one, K two. What is the difference between them? Where do we get them? All of that good stuff. Yeah, let's go through this, Chuck. This is so important. So uh, I put together a presentation. Let's pull that up. And uh, we'll talk about vitamin K and break it down and what you need to know about it. So let's learn about vitamin K. Uh, First, it's important to understand what vitamin K does. Um, We know that it plays a role in coagulation. Coagulation means um, how blood clots form in our body. So if you know, if we're slicing our vegetables and we cut our finger, our finger bleeds, and then soon a clot forms. And those clotting factors use vitamin K in the process. So vitamin K is very important in that. There's also some research showing that it's involved in bone formation. And the last one is more of a theoretical one where we think that if we don't have enough vitamin K, um, that could lead to calcification or calcium to deposit in our blood vessels, in our heart, and that plays a role in heart disease. But theoretical for now, more research needed there. Now, there are two forms, and this is what you brought up, Rose, last week about the different types of vitamin K. There's vitamin K1 or K2, and K1 is known by its chemical name of phyloquinone, and K2 is known by the name of menaquinone. Vitamin K1 is abundant in leafy green vegetables. It's also found in oil. And Vitamin K2 actually has many different subtypes, uh, and we don't really need to get into the details of that, but uh, just important to know that one of the subtypes can be produced by vitamin K by our bodies, the other subtypes are produced by our gut microbes, and um, some subtypes are also found in meat, especially liver, cheeses, fermented soybeans and eggs. And with the exception of liver and certain soybeans, the quantity in these foods is generally pretty low. So the next question is how much vitamin K do we need? Um, So roughly for women, about 90 micrograms a day, so a very small amount. Um, For men, about 120 micrograms. And For children, it really varies with their age. So as little as two micrograms in young infants to about 75 micrograms in adolescents. And now you're probably wondering where you can get this vitamin K from. So just I just wanted to show this for illustrative purposes. Remember we said for adults, we need about 90 to 120 micrograms a day. Um, and then here we see that in Brussels sprouts, half a cup of cooked Brussels sprouts has 110. If you look at beets, um, uh, the beet greens, the leaves and the beets, uh, 350, collard greens, a whopping 530 frozen kale, 565. So it's really easy to get our daily requirements uh, from our leafy green vegetables. And then these are foods that also contain vitamin K, but to a lower extent, such as asparagus or green beans, broccoli, uh, cabbage has a fair amount. So just I just wanted to provide you with a complete list so that you have um, some sense of how much is in different foods. And then again, some more here. So uh, sorry about that. So the question then is, um, some of you may be taking a medication called warfarin. Remember I said that vitamin K is involved in coagulation, so it helps these clotting factors in our body form clots so that we don't bleed. Well, some Usually clotting is beneficial, but sometimes clotting can be harmful. So some people are predisposed um, either through genetics or some lifestyle conditions um, or certain diseases where they will develop abnormal blood clots in their legs or their heart or their lungs. And in that case, we give them an anticoagulant such as warfarin to reduce that clotting. 
And what warfarin is, is actually a competitor of vitamin K. So it prevents vitamin K from doing its job and thereby prevents blood clots from forming. So some people who take warfarin really need to look out for how much uh, vitamin K they need. Um, and generally people are afraid to consume leafy greens because they don't want to interfere with their medication. But what you really need to do is just consistently take the same amount every day. And that's better than avoiding them altogether because as we've been talking um, a lot about on this show is how important leafy green vegetables are in our diet and how nutritious they are. So if you're on a blood thinner called warfarin or coumadin, you can still enjoy them. Just take a consistent amount every day and just work with your healthcare provider or coumadin clinic so that they're aware you're doing this. Now, who needs to take these vitamin K supplements? Well, you know, um, it's really important to understand that vitamin K deficiency is really rare in healthy children and adults. Uh, there are certain situations where we can see it. For example, newborns have low levels of vitamin K at birth. So in the United States and in many countries, infants are given vitamin K at birth. Um, they're given an injection. And then in certain conditions where we have malabsorption, such as celiac disease or Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, we may not absorb enough vitamin K. And whenever we take antibiotics, they can interfere with how much vitamin K we have in our body, um, either by disrupting the gut microbes or interfering with how the liver metabolizes vitamin K. So of course, you know, when it comes to antibiotics, the bottom line is to take them only when they're needed and to avoid unnecessary use. And so who needs to take a supplement? This is the big question because we see supplements all over the drugstores and in health food stores. Well, the research is not necessarily indicating that we need to take it. Um, there's some research been done in osteoporosis treatment and it vitamin K supplements, it's not really clear how helpful they are. And similarly, when it comes to coronary calcification, it's not very clear um, what role they play. Uh, and so this is an ongoing area of research. We have much to learn and over time we'll um, learn this. But for now, it's not clear whether we need to take any supplements. And as we're talking about supplements, I thought this would be a good opportunity to um, really share with you about this act that was passed by Congress in 1994. It's called the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. And what this act did was it separated dietary supplements from drugs. And it basically said that dietary supplement manufacturers could not make claims like this product is intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. Well, that's good. However, manufacturers could make health claims such as this product promotes prostate health or bone health or the circulatory system without knowing whether that's accurate or not. Um, and manufacturers are not required to prove efficacy, safety, or the quality of a product before marketing it. And um, unlike most drugs where manufacturers do post-marketing research and surveillance to look for any adverse reactions, supplement manufacturers are not required to do that. So really, um, you know, what this act did was it really took the burden of safety and efficacy out of the hands of manufacturers and kind of left us on our own to figure out whether this is helpful or not. And so if I said to you, um, I'd like to prescribe a medication, but I don't know if it will help you or hurt you. Mm, I'm guessing you probably would be very skeptical and not take it. Um, and I think that's, you know, we need to have a healthy dose of skepticism when it comes to supplements that are heavily marketed over the counter, because for the majority of them, we just don't know if they're helpful or harmful. Now, having said that, there are some supplements that we all agree we should take, such as B12. Um, you know, that's very likely to um, help us, very unlikely to cause harm. But for the majority of them, we just don't know. 
So instead of spending our money on supplements, let's just spend it on nutritious foods. And you can get plenty of your vitamin K through a nice leafy green salad or however you like to enjoy those uh, leafy green vegetables. Because not only are they rich in vitamin K, they're also rich in fiber and so many other nutrients that we need, such as calcium. And uh, yeah, so opt for that salad instead of vitamin K in a bottle. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of ready to go hop, in, uh, hop on downstairs to the <laughs> fridge and get a salad going for lunch. Uh, question for you, uh, Dr. Rahman, as we kind of uh, finish up with this, um, suppose somebody is on Coumadin, Warfarin, one of those medications mm -hmm. that you were talking about, and you say, well, let's keep the levels consistent, but what if somebody hasn't been eating any greens at all? How should they go about introducing them into their diet safely? Yeah, really great question, um, Chuck, because a lot of people do avoid them because they've learned that there can be interactions. The best thing to do is talk to your healthcare provider. Most people who are taking these medications long term, they're followed very closely by an anticoagulation clinic or pharmacist or their own personal physician. Let them know that you would like to reintroduce these green leafy vegetables into your diet. This is uh, what you have in mind. And then what they can do is simply monitor your levels, which is a fairly standard blood test that's done. And they would just check it more periodically as you're making the changes to see how your levels are and then make adjustments as needed. And then once you reach that stable dose of green leafy vegetables and a stable dose of your INR, which is usually monitored, then you can continue to uh, enjoy them on a regular basis. All right. And if you have a, another question for Dr. Rahman, go ahead and post that in the comment section. We're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag a little bit later on in the show. So Dr. Rahman, stick around. Definitely mm -hmm. looking forward to getting into all kinds of things with you in just a little bit. Thank you, Chuck. All right, but first let's move forward. For months, data has been showing an unfortunate reality for people of color. And that is that they are at a far higher risk for COVID-19. And much like the virus itself, the racial disparities appear to be global, like this pandemic. So why is this happening? Is it genetics? Is it a socioeconomic problem? Uh, let me quote you something from the New York Times. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, 42.2% of white Americans and 49.6% of African Americans are obese. Researchers, though, have yet to clarify how a seven percentage point disparity in obesity prevalence translates to a 240% to 700% disparity in fatalities. So what exactly is going on here? For some answers, we head down to Atlanta to welcome Deetra Dennis to the show. Deetra is a registered nurse with nearly three decades working with patients and a national board certified health and wellness coach teaching the Cooking to Combat COVID-19 course series from the Food for Life program. Deetra, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chuck. Glad to be here. I'm super excited that you are here. First of all, I mean, this is just such an enormous issue. So really, in your opinion, what is going on here? What is driving the disparity? Um, there are many factors. I, I feel that in the um, communities of color, uh, many times there are um, challenges with access. Um, you may, they may not have access to fresh produce. Um, and that, number one, um, could be a major issue. As we know, plant-based foods can really help um, in and the underlying conditions, reversing those and preventing those, as well as even boosting the immune system um, to help combat um, COVID-19. So I say food access is definitely number one um, in, in a lot of the, the issues in the communities of color. All right. So while we have food access, let's talk about just making healthier choices with the foods that are available. What are some of the foods that even in a uh, what is referred to as a food desert, what are the foods that people should be turning to to really try to optimize their health and bring down the risk of those comorbidities, those underlying conditions that are fueling the risk of COVID-19? Yes, I would say, you know, in, in following the guidelines with PCRM, 
um, adding power to the plate using fresh vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and fruit. Um, and ways to get access, again, even though there is food access, many times farmers markets are available um, for the those in communities of color. And I know even in the um, corner stores, is at the counter, but you know, you have your competing um, uh, high fat foods that are there, but they are available there. It may cost a little bit more. It's it's just not always the easiest uh, decision to make, especially when dollars are tight. The economy yeah. was, you know, so difficult for people before, and now it's you're facing almost impossible circumstances. So mm -hmm. definitely a lot going on there. But let's let's also talk about this myth. The layperson may say, "Well, hey, you know, minorities are they're at a higher risk of obesity. More of them are obese because of their traditional diet. You know, lots of soul food, fried food. You know, high fat food. That, in your estimation, that's really kind of a myth, isn't it?" I agree. Yes. So when you go further back, so in 1960, in the 1960s is when the term soul food came about. Um, but if you go further back prior to the en enslavement, um, the ancestors ate more whole food plant based. Um, they ate in season and they ate together. because It was always a sense of community. Um, so, yes, the myth that um, soul food, if you will, uh, is the reason that is why it's so important to return back to the traditional ways of eating because with any culture when you leave those foods of tradition and follow the standard american diet that is when a lot of the um, underlying health conditions you know you see a high prevalence of that and i know that uh, among the african-american community uh, the plant-based uh, diet is actually, it's booming. I believe that that is the fastest growing demographic when it comes to people adopting a plant-based diet. So that's some really exciting and some positive news mm -hmm. to share. But I know that you work with so many people and how often do you get this question? It's like, well, okay, I hear you. A plant-based diet, a vegan diet, but uh, let me pump the brakes on that <laughs> because I want my food to have taste. I want it to taste good. I don't just want to be eating grass all day. So when somebody comes to you and they're like, I don't want to be eating grass. I don't want to just eat a piece of lettuce. I want my food to taste so good. Yes. What do you say to them? Again, going back to the foods of traditions were very well seasoned and very well flavored. Using herbs and spices um, will help you to do that. You know, adding a little cumin, adding the smoked paprika to those collard greens really will have them singing a song um, to you. So, yes, that is something that I definitely encourage and share about adding those herbs and spices to um, your meal. Do, do people raise an eyebrow at first when they're like, wait a minute, I can't, I can't do my greens without ham hock here. Right. You I know, know. <laughs> I, I know. So what do you say? Do you like, just, just trust me. I got yes. this. I got yes. this. Well, always, you know, when you have an opportunity to experience it. So if I prepare the greens, then they're like, Oh, hmm, I don't the ham hock, you know, so that flavor is there. They, they have that familiar taste. Um, when, when I prepare those greens. But let's talk about when you do actually coach up more on the nutritional aspect, you get beyond flavor, you kind of, you know, break down those walls. You're like, okay, we're going to be eating way more than just salad all day, every day, right? We're going to have this phenomenal menu. It's going to be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about when that connection is actually made between a person's health and the food that they are choosing to eat and how that then can go beyond just co combating obesity, but high blood pressure, yeah. high cholesterol, all of these things and that powerful connection that's made. Talk about when you see the, the clients that you've worked with, your patients, and they make that connection. What is their reaction? Well, okay. So what I do with a client, especially in their first coaching session, we go through what are some challenges or barriers that will keep you from reaching that goal of, you know, making healthier choices. It may be finances or it may be time. So we look at that and then overcome those barriers. Well, what can you do with the resources and time that you have? And once we do that, then we get into, okay, so what is familiar? What, are, what do you usually choose? Um, when you are preparing a meal or when you're out and about. And we look at how can you make healthier choices so that you don't feel like you're deprived because when a person feels as if they're deprived, then they're not going to stick to any plan. Um, so that sort of is the connection. We overcome those barriers and then find a common, um, common place 
so they can, you know, move forward and not just be a diet, but truly making it a lifestyle. Uh, I love the fact that, you know, it's so important that they, they not feel deprived, you know, no mm -hmm. matter what, you know, changes somebody is, is about to make, if they feel like they can't go without something that they've loved so much their entire life, like that is a non-starter right there. That is the mm -hmm. wall that so often you just can't get past. So I really, I commend you for taking that approach. That's fantastic. Uh, I, Dietra, I wish that we had so much more time, but I understand that you're also uh, working so heavily right now with this Cooking to Combat COVID-19 series with Food for Life. You have so many other events coming up. What What is on your calendar right now? Where can people find you? What, do you, what are they going to? Okay, so they can find me at Full Circle Health Coaching LLC.com and go to the events tab. And we have on May 31st, we have a din virtual dinner and a documentary screening of The Invisible Vegan. And that will be co accompanied with a back to the root two week jump start. And so, again, that's returning to the foods of old um, in order to improve the health. And that will begin on June 14th. All right. And uh, I, family, friends, everybody's kind of welcome to get this one. You want as many people welcome. as possible. Yes. And there will be a live cooking demonstration of a food for life, healthy basics, some tasty, um, some tasty items. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Those cooking demos, man. Live. I'm telling you, the internet and video on the internet was created just for food. I'm telling you right yes, now. Yes. It and is the greatest thing. Long, so they can cook <laughs> with me and taste the food as they're, as we go. I love that. What a concept. And uh, before we wrap up, I want to extend an invitation for you to come back and join me on the exam room podcast. I would love to dive much more deeply into okay. this topic because clearly there is so much more left to discuss here. So many more ins and outs that we yeah. can really address. And, and I would love to have more time to sit down to be able to do that with you. I'm welcome to do it. All right. Dietra Dennis, thank you so very much thank for joining you. us today. All right. Have a good one. Appreciate that. Okay. The question now is, what is your question? We're going to open up the doctor's mailbag. And for that, we welcome Dr. Vanita Rahman back to the show. Anything that is on your mind, health and nutrition related, go ahead and post that in the comment section. Now we are going to answer as many of these questions as we possibly can before the end of the show. Dr. Rahman, I know you love doing this. I know that you love just going <laughs> right to the viewer, right to the patient, getting to the heart of the issue. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's always amazing to me how much, um, how great the questions are and, and how much I also find myself learning. Um, so I appreciate Rose's question last week, because she brought up something that I had to learn about. And that was great, because I learned something new along the way. So I appreciate our viewers questions. All right. First question comes to us. I love this name. Unstoppable viewer on YouTube by the name of Unstoppable. Uh, how can I reverse type two diabetes as quickly as possible? If I'm not a cook, what are my options? Yeah. So, you know, this is such a such an important topic, um, type two diabetes and how to reverse it. Well, we know from many research studies that changing diet and lifestyle can play a really key role. So transitioning from a typical American or Western diet to one that's low fat and plant-based is so important. And I, I can't say this enough. It's not just enough to go plant-based, but to also keep it low fat, because with that combination, um, we see the best results. And if you are not a cook, you don't have to cook, but there are easy recipes you can find on our website at pcrm.org um, and in other websites too, things you can whip up easily um, using ingredients that you can easily purchase in the store. Um, but hopefully the fact that someone is not crazy about cooking shouldn't stop them from adopting this way of eating because it's easier than you think. Um, so uh, definitely look into it. And we've seen so many of our patients do this and benefit. And so many of our research participants have benefited. So definitely worth a try. Uh, I agree. My wife was uh, never much of a cook, but over the last couple of months since we've been at home, she's been actually spending a lot of time in the kitchen with me learning. And now she, you know, she'll make dinner and she'll be like, you know what? 
I make this better than you now, you know, so it, it kind of, it kind of becomes fun. It's, it's fun to watch her grow. And by the way, uh, while we're talking about food and recipes, I see a lot of people are kind of chiming in about how they like to make their greens. So if you have a suggestion on that, go ahead and post that in the comment section now as well. I know that a, a lot of our viewers are so into recipes, so let's just go ahead and share the tasty the tasty health, if you will. Uh, Leanne on YouTube, if you saute food with alcohol, does the alcohol really cook off? Yeah, so good question. So alcohol is some alcohol and then water. Um, so when you saute, you know, you're evaporating the water, but some of the alcohol itself probably does stay in the food. Um, some of it may get denatured or um, not stay in. So it's really hard to know. But generally, we're not using very much alcohol when we cook. So hopefully it's a trivial amount. Or you can try sauteing with vegetable broth or just water. Um, so any any kind of liquid works. Um doesn't have to be alcohol necessarily. All right, here's another one for a cooking novice. Elizabeth on Facebook, I have a fridge that is wearing out and won't get swapped out for another three weeks. Upon cursory examination, the tech said it was fine, but foods are feeling warmer to me. So my question is this, where do you properly store each type of vegan food in the fridge? What temperature should be for each area? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so usually, usually fruits and vegetables are kept in the crisper to control the humidity level there. Um, they stay fresh there. And then for everything else, you know, it, it really depends on your fridge. Presumably the temperature is the same throughout the refrigerator. Uh, so it won't make a huge difference. But if your fridge is having some issues and it's not keeping as cool as it once did, then what I would do is put foods that are most likely to go bad quickly on towards the bottom because cold air will sink, warm air will rise um, using that. But generally it's a small confined area and the temperature should be pretty uniform throughout. Um, but you could try that simple tip. But this is something, it's a little bit off topic, but it's really important to keep those healthier foods at eye level and the ones that are maybe a special treat a little bit more out of reach so we're not as tempted. So just a little tip there to help you. All right, time for a couple more. This one fresh from uh, Dami J on YouTube. Just posted this one a minute ago. Uh, would you eat kale if you can't find it organically? Should I wash and soak it first with water and baking soda? Yeah. Um, so actually, um, you know, it's always preferable to eat organic if you can, but if you can't find organic, I would still encourage you to eat it. Um, it's always better to get our leafy green vegetables and then not, you know, the average American is getting less than two servings of vegetables a day. So we need to get them as much as we can. And the FDA recommends for our vegetables to just wash them with water. Um, you don't need to do much more than that usually. And that takes care of it. Some, some, green leafies also come triple washed and that's generally safe. So that's, that's what I would go with. If you can't find organic, then eat non-organic because the bottom line is to consume it. Kale is full of um, vitamin K, it's full of calcium, full of fiber. So let's get it in however we can. All right. This one comes from MTF on YouTube, throwing down a challenge for you here. Here we go. My brother lives in Fairbanks, Alaska. Health professionals there agree with the whole food plant-based diet, but say that it is not possible since fresh fruits and vegetables are not available most of the year. Care to comment? Challenge. Wow. Yeah. You know, um, so Alaska is somewhat um, remote compared to the rest of the um, United States. Um, however, even if you can't find fresh fruits or vegetables, uh, frozen fruits or vegetables are great options. They're just as nutritious. And some people say they might even be more nutritious because um, they're packed on site where the nutrients are um, more available. And um, canned fruits and vegetables could also be an option. Um, you just have to be a little bit mindful of the sodium content. And the other thing that I routinely do here is when something is in season and I get a lot of it and whatever I don't use, I'll just freeze it. So I'm 
making my own frozen vegetables or fruits. This works for grapes, strawberries, blueberries, even bananas. Um, you can freeze virtually any fruit or vegetable and it'll keep really well. Um, so that could be an option. But definitely the frozen section would be a great place to start. And uh, I've done a number of episodes of the Exam Room podcast with your colleague, dietitian Lee Crosby, aka the Fiber Queen, where she and I went all over uh, just how to do plant-based on a budget. And because it's on a budget, so much of that focused on uh, frozen foods and mm -hmm. how well they keep and the amazing things that you can actually make when uh, your produce is not fresh. You know, you can still have some incredible dishes. So I highly recommend you going over to pcrm.org slash podcast and searching for plant-based on a budget and listening to that episode. I think that you'll get a lot of great tips there. Uh, here's a great question from J.A. What are good sources of plant-based calcium? Oh, so beans and greens. That's what you want to remember. So the leafy green vegetables that we just talked about are also not only a great source of vitamin K, they're also a great source of calcium, uh, except for spinach. Spinach has calcium, but it kind of holds on to it. It doesn't release it. But kale, broccoli, bok choy, these are all great sources of calcium. But so are some um, beans, so chickpeas, uh, black beans, lentils, these can all be a great source of calcium too, and also a good source of protein. And then of course, there are calcium fortified foods such as soy milk or almond milk, which are often fortified with calcium. Um, vegan yogurts can be fortified with calcium too. And then my personal favorite, tofu, um, great source of protein and also a great source of calcium. Ah, and here is a great question from Anu. Anu is a frequent flyer on the exam room live. I love this. Uh, my question is, can I be liberal in eating fruits and being a pre-diabetic, meaning do I need to eat just a half of an orange or apple as a midday snack? Yeah, you know, I know this, we get this question so much because for so long, diabetics have been told um, or pre-diabetics have been told avoid um, sugary, uh, avoid sugar, or in other words, um, avoid fruits because they have sugar. So let's just break this down. Um, you know, fruits do have sugar, but it's a very small amount um, compared to, say, baked goods, which have a lot more added sugar. But when it comes to controlling our blood sugar, it's not really the sugar, it's the fat. And this is so completely counterintuitive. We would think to control blood sugar, all we have to do is reduce our amount of sugar, but we know that doesn't work. Um, research has shown it's the amount of fat in our meal that determines how well insulin works. So really keeping the fat low is key, but please enjoy those fruits. They're great for you. They're full of fiber, full of vitamins, um, and so much healthier than a baked dessert or, um, or ice cream, for instance. All right, change of pace here. This one comes to us from Grace Hanks on Facebook. What about eating fat for brain health? Hmm. So this, uh, um, so let's let's break this down too. We in the research that was done for cardiovascular disease by Dr. Dean Ornish or Dr. S. L. Steen, um, people were eating a diet that was about ten percent fat. And we know that what's good for the heart is also good for our brains. Um, in fact, you know, cognitive decline or Alzheimer's disease um, or other causes of dementia share the same pathophysiology as cardiovascular disease, meaning um, the same things that help our heart will help our brain, as I said. So um, we don't have to increase our intake of fat for the brain. In fact, it's important to keep it around that 10%. And the question comes up with these omega-3 fatty acids, if they can protect brain health or if, if we should take supplements. So what we know is that research done in supplements did not show that it made a difference in cognitive decline. So the most important thing is to eat a low-fat plant-based diet, and we can get all of these essential fatty acids from the fats that we consume naturally in our food, like nuts or seeds or avocado. We don't have to take supplements or go out of our way to incorporate more fat into our diet. Um, there's no efficacy in doing that as far as we know. All right. Final question comes to us from Richard on Facebook. Do you ever recommend DHA supplements? He says, I have plenty of walnuts, flax, and chia seeds. 
Yeah, you know, that's that's a great um, question right after the one we, we, so the last question was a segue to this one is what I mean. Um, so DHA um, is a type of uh, fatty acid or, or fat that we can get through our diet. We don't have to take supplements. And um, most of the research done on supplements has not shown that it prevents cardiovascular disease or cognitive decline. So again, the most important thing is to consume a healthy amount of those nuts or seeds, um, and you'll get plenty of your essential fatty acids from there. All right, Dr. Vanita Rahman, greatly appreciate your time today. And if we didn't get to your question, no worries. Here's what you're going to want to do. You want to keep posting them in the comment section because even though we're not getting to it today, there's a good chance we could get to it tomorrow or the next day because we do save every single question that comes in. You can also tweet them or send them to us on Instagram. Just make sure that you use the hashtag exam room podcast. You're going to want to hit up at Chuck Carroll WLC or at PCRM on Twitter and at Physicians Committee on the gram. And if you're more of a private kind of a person, no problem. You can also make Make an appointment to visit with Dr. Rahman one-on-one -on -one at the Barnard Medical Center. They are now accepting telemedicine visits, which means that you can be in a number of places across the country sitting on your couch and have a genuine bona fide doctor's appointment with Dr. Rahman or any one of our phenomenal doctors and dietitians over at the Barnard Medical Center. So to make that appointment, you see it on the screen right now, visit barnardmedical.org or pick up the phone and call 202-527-7500, 202 527-7500. And Dr. Ramon, I would imagine you get tons of nutrition related questions. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is such a big part of our practice, nutrition and lifestyle. So our patients come in, they have a lot of questions specifically about their health and how nutrition can play a role in it. And, and we really dig deep and we try to figure out what's best for them. All right. So heads up, if you live in California, New York, right here in Washington, D.C., or Maryland, Virginia, Missouri, Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts, or Kentucky, any one of those states or locations, go ahead and make your appointment today, barnardmedical.org or 202-527-7500. That is the number that you need to call to make your appointment. And Dr. Rahman and her wonderful colleagues over at the Barnard Medical Center would love to help you lead a little bit healthier of a life. Dr. Rahman, thank you so much. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Thank you, Chuck. All right. And don't forget, coming up on May 31st, a virtual dinner and documentary screening of The Invisible Vegan with Deatrit Dennis, the wonderful guest on today's show, the registered nurse down in the Atlanta area. So make sure that you make your reservations for that May 31st coming up. You see the web address right there on the on the screen coming up May 31st, 2 o'clock p.m., virtual dinner and documentary screening of The Invisible Vegan, going to address so many of the questions that we were talking about on the show today. And coming up on the show tomorrow, we're going to be examining a condition that unfortunately kills somebody every four minutes right here in the U.S. We're talking about 140,000 Americans every year. So tomorrow on the show, we are going to be examining strokes, and that is part of National Stroke Awareness Month. And a lot of you may not know that my wife is actually a stroke survivor. So I'm very much looking forward to learning what we can do to prevent another stroke, what people can do to keep themselves healthy. So we're going to be diving into that on tomorrow's show. How can we all lower the risk? What steps we can take? Going to be sharing a lot of life-saving information. So that's tomorrow, noon Eastern, right back here. So make sure that you hit that like button on Facebook and subscribe button if you're watching us on YouTube so you can make sure that you join us right back here tomorrow at noon Eastern. And then also be sure to join us over on the Exam Room Podcast. Yes, we are indeed everywhere over on Apple Podcasts or wherever shows are available. Hit the subscribe button there as well and download any one of the shows from our archive. Look, we're talking about nearly two and a half years worth of potentially life-saving information with some of the biggest names in preventative medicine, talking about Dr. Neil Barnard, Dr. T. Colin Campbell, Dr. Michael Greger. So many others have been on the exam room podcast by the Physicians Committee. All have wonderful information and we're so gracious to join us here on the show. So subscribe now and make sure that when you do, leave a five-star rating as well. And that, my friend, 
that is all the time that we have for today's show. So my thanks to everyone here at The Exam Room Live, including our wonderful producers, Laura Anderson and Donna Steele, as well as our super talented director, Emily Colon. For Dr. Vanita Rahman and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching. And until tomorrow, keep it plant-based.